Imagine being born and growing up in a home without a father, in a country where there was no democracy and the military rule that controlled every sector of the economy. At that time, Africa was regarded by the Western media as the hopeless continent, a land of famine, poverty, conflict, and war. That was the hopeless reality of the little Jimovia, a man who would later go on to build a multi billion dollar bank in Africa and the biggest bank in West Africa. My name is Jimovia. I'm chairman of Zenit Bank, and I thank you all. The incredible story of this banking godfather crushes the popular argument that you need to be born rich to be wealthy. Rather, it brings to limelight the statement by Bill Gates if you're born poor, it's not your mistake. But if you die poor, it's your mistake. The next Jimovia might not be the bank, but this story serves as a blueprint to provide a behind the scenes look at what it takes to achieve massive success, irrespective of your socioeconomic background or your current financial state. If there is one thing you can take away from this story, it is the fact that we all have the potential to succeed against all odds if we are willing to be diligent, have the right focus, grab opportunities when they show up and learn from the best. In the month of November in the year 1951, a little kid was born to a large polygamous family in Abo, a location in a South local government area of Delta State, in the South-South geopolitical zone of Nigeria. His father, who was a well-respected chief in Abo Kingdom of Delta State, married three wives and gave birth to nearly a dozen children. Unfortunately for Jimovia, life started too early for him because at the little age of four, he lost his father to a severe heart attack. And due to the poor medical facility available at their disposal, his father's life could not be saved. This was a harsh reality for Jimovia's mom because she was now left with the responsibility of taking care of the family. But being a virtuous woman who put her family first, she started a small trading business to put food on the table. Under these unfavorable circumstances, nobody would have imagined a brighter future for the young Jim. But regardless of her mom's diligence, Jim was fortunate to remain in school because his elder brother who worked in Lagos was always able to send some money out of his monthly salary to support his education. After his secondary school education at Ika Grammar School, Jim traveled to Lagos to join his elder brother. In the process of hustling to make ends meet, he got a job as a junior clerical officer at Union Bank, formerly known as Barclays Bank in Lagos. He worked diligently in his new position for three years before moving to the United States for his university education. Jimovia described his university days as a foundation of all that was to come. His decision to study business administration was partly made possible due to the advice from some of his uncles who had built successful businesses of their own. But during his study at the Southern University of Louisiana in the United States, he took some computer science courses which piqued his interest and got him super excited about computers and the future possibilities of this new technology. His passion for computing almost made him to change his college major to computer science, but his course advisor advised him to focus on his main track. But despite taking this advice, he would often sneak into computer science classes whenever he had the opportunity to. Fortunately, during his senior year in the university, he got a night job as a computer operator in the Baton Rouge Bank and Trust. It was a typical data entry job that required him to enter all the transactions for the day and send the printout to the bank manager. Despite the simplicity of the job, it was an indispensable opportunity to practice all he has learned and gain a first-hand understanding of how American banks were utilizing the computer technology to their advantage. Jimovia attributed his fascination for computer technology as a gut feeling, which he believed is one of the most important attributes of an entrepreneur. During that time, which was the year 1975, computers were still a nascent technology, and the microcomputer has just been made available for sale in the market. Bill Gates and Paul Allen had just launched Microsoft, while Steve Jobs and Wozniak were yet to launch their first Apple computer, and even Michael Dell was still yet to graduate high school. Despite the uncertainty that surrounded computers, Jimovia still believed that this technology was the future of work, and he believed that someday it will revolutionize the world and businesses around the globe. After his degree and MBA programs in the USA, he returned to Nigeria to commence his National Youth Service Corps program, also known as NYSC. His NYSC program was filled with lots of dramatic experiences which prepared him well for the task ahead. At that time, his work at his place of primary assignment, which was at Union Bank, began in the morning and ended every 3 p.m. This left him with some free time for the remainder of the day. Instead of idling away his time, he found another job writing feasibility studies for some financial and manufacturing companies. 
This helped him to gain a deeper understanding of the Nigerian business landscape and enabled him to improve his business writing skills and earn more money. In addition to that, he came across another incident that provided him with a sizable side income. This happened at the time when he was driving an old car given to him by his uncle. This was the only car he had and because of its constant usage, coupled with the bad roads and congested traffic in Lagos, the car will always break down and he will take it to the mechanic for repairs. The mechanic was pretty good with his skill and will always transform the car to an impressive state. Jim was always satisfied with his work. Very soon, he noticed that many people in Lagos who were driving old cars were advertising their cars for sale. He decided to make good use of the opportunity. He made a deal with the mechanic that he would be bringing some more cars for him to repair. They agreed on a good price and his first business was born. His business model was simple. Buy old cars at a low price, fix it, then sell it to interested buyers at a huge markup price that was double or triple the original price. This experience was like killing two bears with one stone because he was able to make a extra income and develop his negotiation and sales skills, which will later come in handy some few years later. Immediately after completing his NYSE program in the year 1980, he got a job as a financial analyst in the International Merchant Bank, a subsidiary of First National Bank of Chicago. Because of the time requirement of this job and an increase in social status, he had to stop the used car business to concentrate on his new role. His starting salary was 7,500 Naira per year. During that time, one Naira was equivalent to $1.18. This meant that his yearly salary in Naira was equivalent to $8,800. The economy was far better than it is now because the price of a 544 Peugeot car was just 6,000 Naira. His experience working at the International Merchant Bank was invaluable because he was able to work with and learn from more experienced mentors from top institutions within and outside the country. He also got trained in the areas of financial analysis, treasury management, developmental finance and trade finance. And due to his diligence, he rose through the ranks to the position of a senior manager and from 1987 to 1990, he led the corporate finance department of Merchant Bank of Africa under the technical supervision of Bank of America. Opportunities come to everyone at least once in a lifetime, but only few have the courage and preparation to grab these opportunities when they show up. For Jim, a life-changing opportunity showed up in the year 1980 when there was a fall in global oil prices. This prompted the Nigerian government into action and in a bid to save the economy, they implemented a structural adjustment program to privatize some government-regulated industries and give more opportunities to the private sector. This new act opened opportunities for private investors to obtain banking licenses to operate their own banks. Prior to that time, all banks in Nigeria were controlled by the Nigerian government. This opportunity was too sweet for Jim to ignore. Unfortunately for him, one of the requirements for application was having a 20-year banking experience, but he had only acquired 10 years of experience at that time. But that did not discourage him from applying. He decided to move ahead despite having little or no significant advantage. The only difference for him was confidence in his abilities. At that time, there were two types of licenses available. The first was the merchant bank license, and the second was the license for commercial banks. Out of the two licenses, the one for the commercial bank was more difficult to get and more expensive. It required a total shareholder contribution of 20 million naira to get, which was approximately $4 million, while the license for the merchant bank required a total shareholder contribution of 6 million naira, approximately $1.2 million. The majority of the applicants went for the easier and cheaper option, but Jim opted for the more difficult option, a decision he also attributed to his gut instinct. He also had a gut feeling that if he can take the time to diligently write the application himself without assorting it to a third party, he could stand a chance of being considered. According to a statement by Jimovia, a company brand stands for who the founder is. As such, my brand was almost a form of negotiation in and of itself. My way to see myself, my experience and my vision to the central bank directors and ultimately to the Minister of Finance. His first step to achieving this was getting a name for the bank. He found this aha moment when he came across the name Zenit, which had the same meaning of top or pinnacle in English, French, Latin and Spanish. Little did he know that the name would be a prophecy of what is to come. The second was designing the logo for the bank. The design for the Zenit logo was the letter Z, bisected by a slice of white space, with the top of the letter rendered a dark grey and the bottom in red. It was the first bank logo in Nigeria to include the color red. Despite various discouragement from some of his acquaintances, he stuck with that color, seeing it as a symbol of power and love. The Zenit logo went on to become one of the most iconic brand logos in the industry, winning multiple awards in the process. For Jim, his three guiding principles for creating an excellent brand identity is simplicity, broad-based appeal, and a combination of something that is simultaneously recognizable and unique. In addition to the name, 
and logo branding. Zeni Bank took some cue from international companies like McDonald's and Citibank and implemented a concept known as place branding. This was a way of structuring your office building to look the same regardless of the place and location. Through this marketing strategy, Zeni Bank was able to build a solid brand identity that stood out from the others. Applying the Zenit license was a long and arduous process. The first step was submitting his application which included a long feasibility report which he was able to write easily due to his previous experience writing feasibility reports for different companies during his NYSE. The next step was an interview with officials from the Central Bank of Nigeria. During the interview, they made it clear to him that he could not be granted a license because he did not meet the requirements of having a 20-year banking experience. But his confidence and unshakable belief in his abilities enabled him to make a compelling argument of why he was a great fit. At the end, he was able to gain their trust and respect. And out of the 25 applicants who were shortlisted, only three had 10 years of experience. And that was the last time such opportunity was ever given. Subsequently, it became a compulsory requirement to have a 20-year banking experience to be granted a license. The final step in the hurdle was getting the 20 million Naira shareholder or equity contributions. This presented another challenge because out of the 30 shareholders who initially indicated interest, only 24 were still available. The others opted out due to the fear of rumors of violence among the shareholders of new banks in the boardroom. Despite the exodus of these fearful investors, he was able to raise the required sum in 30 days to complete the process. But the next obstacle he was going to face was going to be more bloodier. In the early hours of the 22nd of April 1990, after Jim had deposited the required sum of 20 million naira for the bank and license, there was an announcement on the radio regarding a bloody coup perpetrated by Major Gideon Gwazaoza, a military officer. The coup was against the incumbent government of President Ibrahim Babangida. Their complices had taken control of major locations such as the military headquarters, the presidential lodge and a radio station. This nefarious untimely event brought the nation to a halt and every business activity ceased, including the issuing of the banking licenses. But in a dramatic turn of events, there was a counter-coup by a different group of soldiers loyal to the incumbent government. The counter-coup was successful and the perpetrators of the coup d'etat were overthrown. They were able to take back control of the radio station and in the next few hours, an announcement was made through one of the lieutenant generals updating the general public on the state of affairs. Later on, the most senior general of the armed forces ruling council reassured the citizens of the safety of the nation and gave an order for everyone to continue their business as usual. Within the next few days, the general approved 10 banking licenses, including that of Zenith Bank. This was the start of the new dawn. After acquiring the license, the operations of Zenith Bank started in earnest. The first Zenith office was located at Victoria Island in Ajosi Adogun Street. The office was a duplex, shared by a tenant and his wife. The building had two compartments with Zenith occupying one side while their co-tenants occupied the other side of the building. It wasn't an easy situation for the other tenant because the bank was always filled up and the driveway was often blocked. At some point, the tenants could no longer tolerate the noise and constant infringement of their privacy, so they vacated the building, allowing Zenith Bank to occupy the entire block. The garage was converted to the customer service unit and the first customer to patronize the bank was the director of a Chinese company who had previously worked with Jim Ovia in his previous places of employment. Due to the cordial relationship he had with Jim, he decided to repay his excellent service by doing business with his bank. As Jim always noted, in business you do not burn bridges, rather you do everything you can to build solid relationships with your clients because you do not know what tomorrow holds. In order to ensure that the bank succeeded, Jim created a list of ground rules and company policies to instill strict discipline and excellence among his staff. The first ground rule was to ensure that all staff would be at the office on or before 7 a.m. or be locked out. The second policy was to imbibe the culture of constant learning and a growth mindset. To achieve that, he scheduled a training program for his staff every weekend. In addition to that, he also sent them on leadership trainings and conferences to develop their leadership skills and other significant skills necessary for growth in their respective fields. He placed such a high premium on his employees and mentored them to become leaders according to their capabilities. In return, he built a team of loyal soldiers willing to go the extra mile to ensure that Zenith Bank attained greater heights. The third policy was a high focus on excellent customer service. He noted that before any training session on the weekends, they will always start with a famous quote by Kenneth Elliott, which states that The customer is the most important visitor on our premises. He is not dependent on us, we are dependent on him. He is not an interruption to our work, he is the purpose of our work. He is not an outsider to our business, he is part of it. We are not doing him a favor by serving him, but rather, 
He is doing us a favor by giving us the opportunity to serve him. This quote was a constant reminder of the importance of the customer and why they should be treated with utmost respect. To set the pace, Jim would often go home every evening with a report of the day's transactions. On reaching home, he would go through the entire report, note the customers' names and call every single one of them to thank them specially for banking with Zenit. This act of gratitude created an unbreakable bond with the customers. The fourth policy was creating a culture of mutual trust and the rule was that they would only accept customers who they have gone out to look for or knew enough about to invite. The fifth policy was imbibing a culture of employee appreciation. The rule was based on a popular statement from their Carnegie which tests us. People work for money but go the extra mile for recognition, praise and rewards. To implement this principle, the names of the most outstanding employees were published every month on the company's bulletin board. Then he would write personalized letters to each of them, lauding them for their achievement. This motivated employees to set their sights on exceeding expectations every month. This culture of employee appreciation has continued till this day. Today, it is done in a more elaborate fashion known as the CEO Awards, which had its maiden edition in the year 2001. This event was one of the most outlandish events in the banking industry, often referred to as the Grammy Awards of the banking industry by social pundits. The sixth policy was a culture of recruiting only the best students who came out top of their classes. This ensured that Zenith Bank had some of the brightest minds in all areas of their business. Because of this process, the National Association of Accountants in Nigeria changed the location of the semi-annual conferences to Zenith Bank to accommodate the large number of accountants in the bank, which was the largest for any single organization within Nigeria. By setting all these guidelines and having a leader who was willing to walk the talk, Zenith Bank was able to preserve its culture of excellence and propel itself to the top of the ladder. In addition to setting these rules, disciplinary measures were also put in place to punish any infraction of rules. In one case, during its early days, a senior executive authorized the loan request without following due process. In response, most of his responsibilities were stripped of him and in the next few years, there was no repeat of such case. Also, the pioneers of the bank were so disciplined that there was no late coming among the senior executives in their first year of operation. Only few people would know that Zenith was the first bank in Nigeria to go digital and adopt the internet technology. Since his days in the university, Jim had always believed that computers were the future of work. He strongly believed that any business that failed to go digital would soon become extinct. Therefore, at the very beginning, he set his sights on digitizing Zenith Bank's operations. Unfortunately, at that time, there were no internet in Nigeria, no ATMs and no debit or credit cards. Therefore, digitizing Zenith's operations was a heckling task that required building large infrastructure that would make the internet possible in Nigeria, and that was his next project. His greatest motivation in taking up this task was not only the success of Zenith Bank, he also knew that bringing the internet to Nigeria would transform the nation's economy and bring about numerous opportunities for individuals and businesses. Sequel to that, he founded Cyberspace in 1995, an internet service provider to offer both data transmission and internet services. He also partnered with different local and international organizations to bring this to fruition. After some few years, he was made the pioneer president of the Nigerian Internet Group. Within that period, the Nigerian telephone company Nitel were the only available company that had the infrastructure for data transmission. Unfortunately, its coverage capacity was very limited and the speed was very slow. To solve this problem, Jim visited Basingstoke in England and acquired a US military gadget that had the capacity of transmitting up to 2.4 MHz spectrum of data. But in getting back to Nigeria, he faced another major obstacle in setting up the VSAT to transmit data. The military was still in charge of the country then, and they saw the VSAT dish as a spying device that was a threat to national security. Therefore, the incumbent Minister of Communication ordered the soldiers to pull it down. Since his first plan has failed, he visited the director of the telephone company Nitel to strike a deal to use their telephone lines to transmit data. But the acting director was also unconvinced about the potential of the internet technology and refused to grant permission. This brought the entire plan to a halt. But after a few years, the United Director was replaced with a new director who understood the economic potential of this technology. And before long, Jim's request was granted, and he was able to set up a visa connected to South Africa's telecom, which allowed the bank to enjoy a seamless internet service and connect all their branches through the internet. In no distant time, they became the talk of the town, and more people wanted to bank with Zenit, a testament to how innovation can transform a business fortune. But that was not the only time that Zenith invested in infrastructure development to enhance their business processes. In another situation, they created their own power supply by acquiring three giant generators. Each generator served as a backup to the other, which ensured that there was constant power supply for the bank. This was a way to solve the unsteady power supply in Nigeria. 
Another issue was the bad road network which led to its head office in Victoria Island, Lagos. Previously, it was in a bad state, riddled with potholes which discouraged some customers from coming to the bank. To solve this problem, Jim reconstructed that road, transforming it into a beautiful sight to behold. Because of his proactiveness, the Lagos government gave Zenit Bank an official permission to maintain that road network for the next 30 years. All of this helped to ensure that the bank's operations were not affected by any infrastructural breach. In the year 1999, the American President Bill Clinton signed into law the HR 775 Y2K Act. This act was enacted in response to concerns surrounding the Y2K book, which referred to potential customer glitches and malfunction that could occur as a result of the date change from 31st December 1999 to 1st January 2000. To explain this further, during the 60s and 80s, when writing computer codes, programmers represented the years in two-digit codes to save space and memory in the computer systems. For example, the year 1975 was represented as 75 and the year 1980 as 80. Therefore, there was the public fear that when the year 2000 comes around, computer programs will recognize the year 1900 instead of the year 2000. If something of that nature would occur, it would affect the financial market, which depended on the right timing to function accurately, leading to a lot of billions of dollars in the stock market globally. Coupled with that, a lot of people feared that the negative effect of the Y2K would also transcend into other industries, including the aviation, military, and other sectors that depended on the computer technology to function. It was like the fear of an impending pandemic. Because of the widespread concerns of the Y2K, many countries and organizations swung into action to protect their systems from any catastrophic failure. The United States of America as a country was reported to have spent over $100 billion to prevent its systems from crashing. Some international organizations in Nigeria were not confident of the ability of Nigerian institutions to handle the effect of the Y2K. One of such companies was ExxonMobil, a banking partner to Zenith Bank, and they opted to move their funds to an American bank instead. Prior to that time, Jim had already taken some preventive measures by visiting the U.S. with a team of some of his best engineers to acquire a software that would protect his systems from any potential crashes. Because of this, he was able to calm the fears of the ExxonMobil executives and gave 100% insurance against all their financial assets within the bank. Fortunately for everyone, the 1st of January 2000 came and passed and there were no computer crashes and no service disruptions. Many people believe that there were no negative effects because the 1st of January fell on a Saturday, which was not a business day. Regardless of what could have happened, Jimovia believed that a business leader must not be afraid to spend money when it is necessary, because an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Having overcome this, it was time for Zenith to take the next step. In the year 2004, the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria gave a directive that banks in Nigeria should raise their capital basis from the previous rate of 2 billion naira to 25 billion naira to protect against unexpected bank failures due to low liquidity. Failure to achieve that within a specific duration could result in their licenses being revoked. Prior to that time, the highest amount that has been raised in an IPO in the Nigerian capital market was 11 billion naira, which was achieved by First Bank of Nigeria in the year 2002. Some sources has it that Zenith Bank was already one week into an IPO with an objective to raise 9 billion naira in the capital market. Therefore, with this new directive from the CBN, Zenith Bank had to revise its marketing strategy to reach this new goal. To achieve this, Jim and his team adopted two marketing strategies. The first strategy was to divide their sales teams according to their regional locations and assign them specific sales targets. Their mission was to discover new investors and convince them to invest in the Zenith Bank shares. To motivate these marketers, they were promised some rewards according to the number of shares sold. The second strategy was to employ the services of external marketing and PR agency. In collaboration with the Zenith team, they were able to come up with a unique marketing slogan from generations to generations, which passed the subliminal message that the excellent performance of Zenith Bank will continue across generations. In addition to that, they designed different advertising materials for different platforms such as radio, television and newspapers. With this complete marketing arsenal in place, Zenith Bank was able to launch their marketing campaign and the results were astounding. They were able to exceed their goal and raise a total sum of 48 billion naira, equivalent to $360 million in line with the current exchange rate at that time. The CBN directive swallowed up many banks, and out of the 90 functional banks in Nigeria, only 25 survived the blow. The others were either merged or acquired. Further to this, Zenith Bank officially became a public limited company on the 17th of June 2004 and was subsequently listed on the Nigerian Stock Exchange on the 21st of October the same year. 
Fast forward to March 2007, Zenith Bank launched a branch in the UK after receiving a license from the Financial Services Authority of the United Kingdom. And in the year 2013, it went public on the London Stock Exchange and listed $850 million worth of its shares at a sell price of $6.8. But after going public, one of its first major tests to prove its sustainability was the 2008 global financial crisis. Many were unprepared for the Wall Street crash that occurred in the year 2008. It started at a series of events that began in 2007 and culminated on the 15th of September 2008 when Lehman Brothers, the fourth largest investment bank in America, filed for bankruptcy. This in turn led to a global financial crisis that rocked the entire world and bankrupted many financial institutions. Eventually, the effect of the Wall Street crash reached the Nigerian financial market, which led to the Nigerian capital market losing 50% of its value in the process. Many banks were badly damaged due to this crash, and the Central Bank of Nigeria had to intervene to save some of these banks. To restore the health of the economy, the CBN ordered the stronger banks to initiate transactions with the weaker banks by placing deposits to circulate more funds. This was a vital move that helped to solve the issues created by the global financial crisis. Fortunately, Zenit Bank was one of the few banks that were unaffected by this crash due to its large capital base and strong asset quality and capital adequacy ratio, which was enough to rescue up to four banks if necessary. According to Steve Jobs, innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. Zenith Bank was able to reach its tremendous heights today due to its ability to anticipate the future and make new inroads long before the other banks could think of it. In addition to becoming the first digital bank in Nigeria, Jim and his team were able to adopt different strategies to gain an unfair advantage and propel an exponential growth. Some of these strategies include In the 2005 fiscal year, Jim had a meeting with his team to brainstorm ways to reach a higher revenue target. To inspire action, they adopted a slogan for the year, surpassing customer expectations, which was placed in strategic positions at the Zenith offices to serve as a constant reminder to every employee. During that year, at a time when electronic cash transfers were not available, one of the ways they implemented this goal was going the extra length of visiting the petrol stations of their two giant customers, ExxonMobil and Total Petroleum, and helping them collect and pick up their cash sales without having them come to the bank themselves. Another strategy executed by the bank was an in-person timely delivery of the monthly statement of accounts of each of their corporate customers at the first day of each month in their various offices. These moves were so successful that other banks soon copied that, a great example of what it means to be a leader in your industry. Following the success of these strategies, Jim made a policy to adopt a new mission statement for each year to ensure that the bank continuously evolved and threatened its position at the top. He understood that success can easily lead to complacency which can eventually result in failure. Therefore, he was keen to avoid complacency and instill a culture of constant innovation. According to his own words, in any significant commercial venture, you are never done pushing, expanding, looking for new and better ways to do things. The task of building a healthy enterprise is never over. Thus far in this story, one unique attribute about the life of Jimovia is his ability to anticipate the future. But even that special skill did not stop him from missing a great opportunity that was to come. In the year 2001, the Nigerian government approved the adoption of the mobile phone technology. Interested organizations were told to pay the sum of $285 million for a license. At that time, it was still difficult to determine if that sector would be profitable. Because of that, Jim did not consider it a worthwhile investment to make. But in the coming years, he discovered that he was wrong because it turned out to be a highly profitable industry with the mass adoption of the GSM phones by Nigerians. As fate may have it, in the year 2008, a new opportunity presented itself to get a bite of the national kick. The government at that time gave an opportunity for smaller companies to acquire a smaller license at a cost of $4 million to operate a regional mobile phone line that only worked in specific regions of the country. Unfortunately, these new companies found it difficult to make profits because of the location restrictions, which limited the number of customers they could acquire. Because of this, many of them were willing to sell. Being an innovative entrepreneur, Jim acquired three of these companies and combined them together to form a larger company, which he named VisaPhone. 
This provided him with a larger spectrum to transmit across the different regions of the country. A smart move that proved to be a wise decision later on. Over the years, Jim was able to build a company up to 2 million subscribers with 2,000 staff and a global mobile phone coverage. The resilient growth of Visa Phone attracted the telecom giant MTN and very soon, the MTN CEO reached out to Jimovia for a possible sell. Due to the increasing cost of running a mobile phone company and the high competition, Jim thought it a wise decision to sell if a good offer comes in. After a lengthy negotiation process, both parties were able to come to an agreement and at the end of the fourth quarter of 2015, the Nigerian communications company approved the deal to sell Visa Phone to MTN for an undisclosed fee, a deal that Jimovia termed as an offer he couldn't refuse. Until now, it has seemed that everything about Jimovia had gone as planned, but life is not always so smooth. Making it to the top of the ladder is a rigorous process that often comes with challenges and sometimes controversies. For Jimovia, one of his most notable controversies that threatened his reputation was the controversy regarding the Paradise Papers. In the month of November 2017, the Premium Times reported that the CBN governor, Godwin Emefiele, and Jimovia were involved in a tax avoidance scandal. According to the report, both men skipped the payment of about £11 million value added taxes while importing luxury jets into the European Union in the years 2013 and 2015. This was discovered after a German newspaper and the international consortium of international journalists obtained a 1.4 terabyte leaked data containing over 13.4 million records, now regarded as the Paradise Papers. When he was reached out by newsmen regarding these allegations, Jim responded, Independent professional advice was taken from the international fame of Eston Young LLC with respect to all relevant tax issues. He further stated through his lawyer that if the professional advice given to them by Eston Young was found to be wrong, his company, Oviation Limited, will repay the value-added taxes. Eston Young, on the other hand, also rejected all claims that the facilitated tax avoidance schemes, resulting in the creation of artificial leasing businesses. In an official statement by the company, they said, All our advice, whether in planning on compliance, is based on our knowledge of tax law and providing transparency to tax authorities. Eston Young does not offer mass market tax planning schemes. We support efforts to ensure that tax systems remain robust and relevant to today's ever-changing business world. At the end of the investigations, there were no reports that he was found guilty of tax invasion. A good takeaway from this sort of controversy is to always ensure you take professional legal advice when doing business from professional bodies, especially when it involves a cross-border transaction. A little mistake could dent your reputation which you've spent years to build. The year 2010 marked the end of an era after Jimovia announced he would be stepping down as the founding CEO of Zenibank. It marked the year of a 20-year reign of an exemplary leader and visionary who rose from the ranks of a mere bank black to be regarded as the godfather of banking. But he was due for a return in 2014 as the chairman of the board of directors and he has remained in that position until date. The principles he instilled in the bank and the culture of excellence he created has helped the successive CEOs to transition into their roles seamlessly and maintain the high standards of the bank transforming it into the biggest bank in Nigeria and West Africa by Tier 1 Capital, with shareholders' funds of up to $3 billion and a total asset base of over $22.8 billion. By taking a break from his role as a CEO, he was able to venture into the real estate business, starting his real estate company, Phantom Capital, a private equity firm that has built some of the most outstanding structures in the country, such as the Civic Center and the Civic Towers in Lagos. He's a mentor to many great entrepreneurs. In a speech given by Abu J. I. Jimokede, the former CEO of Assets Bank in Jimovia's book launch, he noted that it was the advice given to him by Jimovia that helped him transform Assets Bank from a struggling bank to a powerhouse. He is also involved in numerous philanthropic activities through his Jimovia Foundation and partnerships with other entrepreneurs such as Bill Gates and Dangote. He has been awarded numerous awards both local and internationally, and in 2018 he was appointed as chairman of the African Regional Business Council of the World Economic Forum. According to his own words, if I can do it, we can too. But let them remain focused. Let them remain very committed to what they believe in. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for sticking with us to the end. If you enjoyed this video, click on the like button and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to learn more about Jim Ovia's incredible story, you can get his book, Africa Rise and Shine. You can find the link on the description box below. Just the mice here we have there. Let's make it happen.